Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Center for American Progress. We're very pleased you've joined us here this morning for our event, uh, Transatlantic Security in the Post-Bush Era. My name is Ruben Brigitte. I'm the director of the Sustainable Security Program here at the Center for American Progress. And we have a very lively topic to discuss this morning. Uh, the, as you well know, the relationship between the United States and Europe has been one of the linchpins both of our common security and indeed for the security of much of the world. And those relations were strained in very important ways over the last eight years. Some of those strains came as a result of style, uh, with references to old, old Europe versus New Europe. Uh, some of those strains had to do with significant issues of differences over substance, whether it had to do with detainee policy or uh, policy on an invasion of Iraq or on a host of other issues. And yet we still have common threats, whether it be from issues of climate change, issues of mass genocide, to harder security issues in Afghanistan and Iran, even to more theoretical and philosophical issues, such as the role of international law as it relates to international security and how our various polities may differ with regard to that particular uh, subject. Fortunately, we have with us this morning an expert in these issues who will share with his, us his thoughts on how we might, what the problems and prospects are for the future of uh, transatlantic security relations. The Right Honorable Des Brown, Member of Parliament, has been an MP for Kimmernook and Loudoun since 1997. He has a long and distinguished career as a parliamentarian and as a government minister, in the, over the, holding a series of important posts in the British government over the last decade. Between May 2006 and October 2008, Des, as I am told I should call him, uh, was Secretary of State for Defense, and in this post, he was a cabinet minister charged with making and executing defense policy and providing the means by which it is executed by the armed forces. He also served as Secretary of State for Scotland between June, 19, June 2007 and October 2008, holding this coast concomitantly with Secretary of State for Defense. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce our guest, and the way we'll proceed is he will talk for about 15 or 20 minutes on these issues, I'll ask him a couple of questions, then we'll open the floor to questions for the audience. So with that, the Right Honorable Des Brown. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ruben. Good morning, and good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, the Center for American Progress and to this very important panel discussion, which probably couldn't come at a better time because the person who's now doing the job I previously did in the Cabinet is with all the NATO defense ministers in Krakow as we speak, agonizing, I think, over practical difficulties of some of the issues that we will be um, discussing this morning. This is my second visit in less than a month to the uh, Center for American Progress, and I'm delighted to be invited back. My brother used to have a saying about me that he had to take me every place twice the second time to apologize, so maybe that's why, <laughs> <coughs> I mean, maybe that's, that's why I'm back. Um, I'm pleased to be here. I just a word or two about the Center, and, and I think, you know, you the Centre deserves some credit for the optimism and hope that we all share in um, some of the international affairs that we will be discussing at the moment because of the um, recent uh, election of uh, President Obama with a very progressive uh, foreign policy um, agenda, which substantially, as Vice President spoke to in Munich um, at the beginning of February, and I'll come back to that in a moment or two. I mean, you're entitled to some credit for the for the uh, optimism that we all share, but you will share with us, I'm sure, the frustration in delivering on the uh, and the expectations that that optimism has generated over the coming years, and we will all work together in doing that. I notice that you have set yourselves the task, among other things this year, of pursuing the issue of restoring America's global leadership, and I think essentially that's what we are, uh, what we will be talking about this morning, and I'm delighted to be invited to, um, to take part in that conversation. I'm sorry you introduced me as an expert. I consider myself to be a work in progress. Um, and, <laughs> and, and would much rather be um, introduced in that fashion. It gets the kind of apology in first. Um, can, I, uh, can I just share with you some of the difficulties I had in preparing for um, the remarks which I want to make over the next 10 or so minutes? The challenge that I faced was a challenge of discipline. I mean, the discipline of what to leave out um, rather than what to include. I mean, we've all become depressingly familiar with the kind of litany of the manifestations of the security environment that we presently uh, live in. There is no exhaustive description of it. You know, the world's population is growing rapidly. Um, 
there are consequences from that alone, but for the fact that at the same time globalisation is diffusing power among many different players, including uh, non-state actors in the international system. And the international system has struggled, I think, um, manfully on some occasions, but invariably unsuccessfully to try to control many of these uh, non-state actors that are operating in this um, increasingly complex environment that is the international system. Climate change, the you know, almost inevitable consequential reduction of habitable land, the competition which we are seeing growing across the world for scarce resources, particularly for energy and water, the forced movement of people, particularly the forced movement of people in some of the poorest areas of the world, weak and failing states, particularly in Africa and parts of Asia, combined, have combined in my lifetime, frankly, well, to be honest with you, probably in the last 10 or 15 years to um, transform the security environment and to give it a dangerous unpredictability. Um, indeed, presently failing states outnumber strong and stable states in this world by a factor of approximately two to one. We, and I do this myself, repeatedly remind people that the instances of violent conflict in the world have reduced and we should congratulate ourselves, I think, in the international community for our ability to be able to achieve that movement. But we have some of the most intractable and difficult violent conflicts um, that you could imagine. And frankly, increasingly, the weakest people, women and children, are being targeted in these uh, violent circumstances. And as a continuing growing risk that ungoverned space will offer havens not just for terrorists but for criminals and for their kind of transnational and multinational uh, organisations to threaten our way of life, there has been a proliferation of organisations across the world indulging in illegal trafficking of drugs and people and of arms. And these same organisations, whatever they, whatever routes they control quite often traffic all three, and sometimes traffic all three at the same time. The Cold War, of course, has ended, but we have a potentially more dangerous nuclear environment in which proliferation is a major threat, and in which there are stockpiles of dangerous materials. And terrorists are actively seeking to obtain access to these uh, nuclear materials if they can, and may indeed have. Invariably, terrorists that we deal with or insurgents use conventional, if improvised, forms of conventional weaponry, but they have an ambition and there's a continuing threat that they will get their hands in chemical or biological or nuclear terrorism and cyber crime and cyber terrorism are already realities. Biotechnology put to illegal purposes and the threat of global pandemics are very, very real and any government worth its salt is planning for the resilience to respond to these uh, developed circumstances in the communities that they have responsibility for. I could go on. I don't want to give you the impression that that list, which is descriptive, was intended to be comprehensive because it's not. I could go on, but I don't intend to go on. It's a, an example, I think, of the challenge of discipline that you have to have in order to try and find examples and um, to uh, discuss the issues that we want to discuss this morning in the limited time that we have. All of this presently and more is happening in this complex global environment where increasingly governments have less control of the uh, infrastructure that they need to deliver both security and resilience for their c citizens. And every aspect of that list which I have just delivered to you, which is by no means exhaustive, has a transatlantic aspect. So hopefully in the course of our discussions we might touch on some of these or even beyond them. There are many others. I didn't even mention you will have noticed the global financial crisis in the consequent effect that it's had in the economy of the world and the economy of our individual countries. What I've done in these chosen remarks is I have gone to Vice President Biden's speech in Munich and using parts of his narrative I have decided to draw examples from three aspects of what he had to talk about and to try to tease from that some of the message that he had for Europe and to see the degree to which Europe has heard that message or is capable even of hearing that message. Early in that speech he said, and I quote, I come to Europe on behalf of a new administration, determined to set a tone in Washington 
and in America's relations around the world. That new tone, rooted in strong partnerships to meet common challenges, is not a luxury, it is a necessity. While every new beginning is a movement of hope, this movement for America and the countries represented in this room is fraught with concern and peril. In this moment, our obligation to our fellow citizens is to put aside the petty and political, to reject zero-sum mentalities and rigid ideologies, to listen to and to learn from one another, and finally, to work, that's my word, finally, to work together for our common prosperity and security. That's what this moment demands, and that's what the United States is determined to do. There's a hopeful message and one which indicates a willingness from the United States to forge a stronger partnership, to engage in meaningful discussions with its European allies, and to work to, towards greater cooperation. It would have been heard, I thought, with silent cheers by those people from Europe who were listening to him saying that they had longed for somebody to come from the United States of America and to give that message to Europe. But within minutes, he said to them, America will do more. But the bad news is, America will ask more from her partners. Now, I'm not sure how many of them are still probably cheering the earlier words. Um, when those words were delivered, and properly so, and the degree to which any of them heard them now, we should reflect, I think, in this point, at the, the reports that are coming out of Krakow, of the responses to the discussions, the painfully, I think, um, repetitive discussions that have been taking place between parts of NATO and other parts of NATO about, about the issue of burden sharing and the apparent lack of any immediate response. But the meeting is not yet concluded, so we shouldn't come to any judgments about whether or not anybody heard that message and whether or not America's partners have decided in that context, and in particular in the existing context of Afghanistan, which I'll come back to in a moment, to accept the challenge to do more. Can I just from that speech go on to draw your attention to three aspects of what Vice President Biden spoke about in order to give you examples of what these challenges mean and to help you assess whether or not we have collectively the ability to respond to these challenges. Because these challenges of greater cooperation and in an America that lives up to the rhetoric of President Obama and of the administration generates a far more significant degree of challenge to the rest of the transatlantic relationship than the previous administration. Let's take first of all the ambition that this great country has to improve its standing in the world. It's long before time, people will say. And it ought to be able to do that. I mean, we ought to be able to get crudely to the point where the leadership that the United States gives to the world is leadership of do what we do and not do what we say. When we talk about the rule of law, we mean that we will observe the rule of law as, uh, as well. And again, you know, there were deafening cheers to the announcement of the closure of Guantanamo Bay and that American will no longer condone torture, and will no longer torture, in fact. But as both the uh, President and the Vice President have made clear, that has consequences. The closure of Guantanamo Bay generates the immediate consequence of what does one do with the 200 plus occupants of that uh, part of the island of Cuba. And what is certain is that without the cooperation, particularly without the cooperation of the United States principal allies in Europe, it is highly unlikely that that can be achieved in a way which is acceptable to the constituencies of all of our countries. So the question is there, the request has been made, who will take these people or who will take some of them? Well, we in the United Kingdom have already taken some of those who were released from Guantanamo, they were our citizens. And it may be that as I speak, we might well be taking another person from Guantanamo who, uh, who, who can be released from there uh, because of its impending closure and who was a resident of the United Kingdom at one stage. And I, speak, I don't speak for the government. I was the immigration minister at one time, but I don't want to hem the immigration minister in. But I suspect that there is a possibility that we might take one or two other people who were residents um, in the United Kingdom. I see no immediate sign 
from the rest of our European partners that people are volunteering to take their share of those who have to be released from Guantanamo. Now, if, um, I do hope that that changes over the course of the next year. And it will, of course, change if there is significant diplomatic discussion between the United States and those who have the ability and the capability to be able to share that responsibility. But it doesn't bear thinking about, in my view, where we could find ourselves in a year's time with the hope and aspiration that we have to achieve this new US standing being undermined by the decisions which the President may have to make about these current det detainees in Guantanamo Bay if he's not able to shift a significant number of them in a burden-sharing fashion. The second point I make, and again I draw on Vice President Biden's remarks, and on this occasion I don't quote him uh, 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 precisely, but he made it clear in that speech that if international law is to be observed, there are two sides to that coin. This is not just a question of enforcing international law in a self-disciplined fashion on oneself. It needs to be capable of being enforced through the structures of international law and those who break it. The rules of international organizations need to be enforced. Now, that's not a message which, in my experience, a significant number of our closest partners are deeply comfortable with. It's a difficult challenge for them in many circumstances where politics intervenes and international organizations that operate by consensus to enforce the rules against the recalcitrant or those who break them. But there are very good examples of international organizations, the WTO being one, a rules-based organization which has a proper enforceable court where one can see the enforcement of these rules changes the way in which people behave in a disciplined fashion. We need to get, in international terms, into a situation where when people break the, break the rules, they cannot do it with impunity and that there are consequences in the organizations and the organizations that enforce those laws will enforce them against them. And that's not an unreasonable request from the United States of America. It's not the justification for them to be driven to operate out with those rules as they did in the past. There is no justification for that. But there needs to be a responsibility on all of us who believe in international law to ensure that it is enforced. That leads me neatly, I think, to the um, second example, which generically I draw from the Vice President's remarks, and that's about the reinvigoration of multilateralism in international institutions. Now, we're not going to do that simply by the transformation or reform of those institutions. I mean, although it would help in terms of the United Nations if the United States would stop the repeated pattern of not paying its dues to the United Nations and leaving it short of uh, resource in order to be able to do what it needs to do. I mean, unfortunately, President Clinton did this in the past, although he corrected that um, in the last weeks or months of his uh, presidency, but it was too late by then. But we now you know, are in a situation again where there is about a billion, a billion dollars of fees owed to the United Nations, and a complaint that the United Nations is not carrying out its functions properly across the world. Well, one might say, well, is that any surprise? But that, but that aside, um, you know, these, these organizations which um, fail to live up to their responsibilities and have caused in the past others and indeed presently people to look for alternatives. I mean, there is talk now about um, creating other organizations, organizations of democracies, for example, or a, a NATO which goes beyond um, the NATO which, which has been the best uh, political and military alliance the world has ever known, but one that goes beyond and, and, and goes into the world. I'm not sure that we can achieve that in the timescale that we have in any event, but making these organizations work is going to be a challenge. And let's look and see the extent to which we can make these organizations work in a transatlantic sense by looking at the most successful organization of NATO and seeing what we need to do to make it function in the 21st century. Well, first of all, we need to pay more attention to the transformation of the organization and less attention to the circumstances of any individual operation that we're involved in. In my experience, and I share this with you, and it was open to the public, 
The issue of transformation of NATO was always the last item on the agenda of any NATO meeting I attended. By the time we got to that, invariably 20 or 25 percent of those countries who were represented at the meeting had gone home. At least at the highest level of representation, they were not present in the room. The discussion of transformation of itself usually took about 35 or 40 minutes. Of the 20 or so countries that were represented in the room at any given time, it was lucky if three or four ever spoke. And with respect to the United States, they never considered this to be a matter of priority at any time at all. So is it any wonder that when we come to look for the capability that we need from countries across the alliance and discover that they have not, tr not transformed their ability to be able to deploy troops in the way in which we need them to, is it any wonder that we are disappointed that they're not able to do it when transformation has never been um, the issue that it should have been post the Cold War? The second point I want to make is that we need to stop putting this organization into crisis. At least we have avoided that inevitable headline on this occasion with the Krakow meeting. I don't remember reading, although I may, in the press cuttings that I go back to in the United Kingdom, find many of these, a NATO in crisis headline. We've been generating that crisis by asking of people a response to burden sharing, particularly in Afghanistan, that they have not been able, either politically or in terms of their capability to deliver, and we need to stop doing it. So we move on in that conversation among ourselves from not making a request about troops which many of these countries can neither politically nor in terms of capability deliver for the southern part of Helmand or the eastern part of, you know, our, of Afghanistan. And we start to say, well, if you cannot do that, then at least the other parts of the comprehensive approach can be delivered by you. You can provide the capability for nation building. You can provide those people that we need to deploy into th that environment in order to teach civil servants, in order to teach teachers of teachers, in order to develop health services, in order to produce proper rule of law and to train police officers. I say this to you without fear of contradiction. When we get into that conversation in detail, we will be disappointed to discover that none of us in the NATO Alliance have that capability. We simply don't have those people to deploy into that environment, and nor do we have, in my view, the justification to ask people who sign up to be civil servants to deploy into that same environment in the same way in which we, um, we ask uh, troops to do it. We have a responsibility to them, a duty of care to them that would not allow us to allow them to move around in the way in which they would need to, to do the sort of work that they need to do. So we're going to be into an enormously disappointed second phase of this argument and discussion when we get to the point where we say, well, if you can't do that in terms of military work, you can at least do this in terms of the other parts of the comprehensive discussion. When we get to that, we will discover it doesn't exist. You should remind yourself that even this great country um, and its last presidency had a president who set about trying to find 200,000, I believe, civilian trainers who were deployable into that sort of environment to do that work because with the resources this country had then, and it was significantly more in terms of uh, financial resources than they have now, they did not have the resources to be able to do it. So I, I just say to you that these conversations are extraordinarily difficult. They, are be, they will be welcomed by Europe um, in the sense that we now have an administration in the United States that is saying things in terms of the way in which it wants to approach these foreign policy issues that people have been waiting for for a long period of time. But don't naively expect that they having or believing that they have moved the United States onto an environment where they're more comfortable, they can actually address the demands of that environment themselves because I don't believe that they can. I just make one final example. I just draw in one final example from the environment of NATO, but particularly the subset of that environment of Afghanistan, and that is the dichotomy of attitude towards the issue of counter narcotics. There is no doubt, and nobody will gainsay this, that there is a direct relationship between narcotics and the insurgency in Afghanistan. There are very good reasons 
and we all went into this environment with these reasons in mind, to separate narcotics which we were prepared to describe as a domestic challenge from the insurgency. Indeed, in my time as the Secretary of State for Defence, we had commanders who stood on blocks of heroin in environments and villages in southern Helmand to address the local villages and then ostentatiously walked off leaving the heroin sitting there in order to give a message to those people that they were about a different thing altogether. That has led, I think, and contributed to a set of circumstances where the one is fueling the other, and indeed there is a circular synergy between these two. Now NATO, now the uh, military leadership, now the majority of those people in NATO, those countries involved in NATO, recognize this relationship and have changed their approach to this. But that's not by any stretch of the imagine shared by all of our uh, colleagues in the NATO environment. There are still a group of European countries who take the view that you have to separate these two issues and that one of them has to be dealt with as a part of the criminal justice system of the country of Afghanistan, which we hope to grow, but which is an apparel state in itself. Can I just, um, I'm conscious of time here, Ruben, and I want to, um, people may want to make contributions and ask questions. I just want to touch on one other issue, um, and I will just touch on it in a, in, a, in, a, in a very rudimentary sense, but hope that people will raise it in discussion. The third point, and I draw this also from the Biden speech, is the issue of non-proliferation and uh, nuclear disarmament. This uh, US administration has given this whole area an enormous injection of, uh, I think, hope and energy. I regularly uh, consult the White House website and foreign policy, and I am encouraged to see the degree to which they repeat and expand the piece on the website that relates to the whole issue of disarmament, non-proliferation. We have very little time across the Atlantic to get ourselves into a position of improving our performance in that area. The review conference of the non-proliferation treaty is due to take place in 2010, and essentially since the last conference took place, very little, if anything, has been done at all by the P5 states. The amount of engagement you know, across those states and beyond um, in order to show the sort of leadership that we together, particularly the United States and the UK and hopefully also France, ought to give to this whole um, area towards eventually, one would hope, the uh, achievement of the ambition of a nuclear-free world in terms of weapons, which we now all share because we've now all become multilateralists, which we all were anyway in the first place, um, has got very little time. Um, if we are to, if we are to um, make the progress that we want to see and to start the sort of progress um, that will inevitably lead to a reduction in these dreadful weapons that none of us wants to have responsibility for at all. But I'm not sure that we are even equipped as a generation of leaders with the vocabulary to have those discussions because we have been saying nothing about it for so long. So we need to work together very, very closely in that, and I'm happy to those who are in the room you know, be guided as to how we can achieve that and how we can energize particularly the United States of America to become involved in that process and to give us the permission that we need in Europe to be able to be engaged in the process to the extent that we want to. So I'll draw my remarks to a close at that stage at this stage um, and I'll put these papers away lest I'm tempted to move into yet another example of something which is no simple answer very much for listening to me. I'm happy to hear from you, your comments or questions, and I'll try to answer them honestly. Okay. Thank you very much. If I may, um, I'll throw off the first question and then move to the audience thereafter. Um, you know, Des, the first example that you raised uh, is with the issue of uh, failed and fragile states, which is something that we at the Sustainable Security Program focus on a great deal. Um, perhaps the most pressing of those states, as you also mentioned, is Afghanistan. And uh, it's now very clear that the solution to Afghanistan is not only regional, but there's sort of two parts. There is the, the military part, sort of the shooting and killing and the non-kinetic um, parts of state building and, 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 um, and whatnot. It's clear that, we, that the United States is not going to be able to um, uh, expect more troops from our European partners in Afghanistan. 
uh, at least not substantially more, but you've also made the case that we can't probably likely expect much more in the case of, in the way of uh, uh, civilian state building uh, efforts as well, which then leads to the question, well, what future hope is there for transatlantic, certainly NATO cooperation with regard to solving the problem in Afghanistan if, in your judgment, we can expect neither more troops nor more civilians to do state building? I, I mean, in, in my view, and I, I've been of this view for some time, um, I mean, I, I, I think I can say with confidence because there are people in this room whom I've had this conversation with. I've been talking about a regional solution to Afghanistan for as long as I've been involved in Afghanistan, which is for about three, three and a half years now, um, you know, as a minister and, and beyond that. The, the answer lies in developing regional capacity. Um, and and the, the region includes, among others, um, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, and Iran. I mean, all of those countries have an interest in um, seeing a stable and best governed Afghanistan. I, mean, I'm, I, I just say in the passing, I regret the fact that we, that we still use the word democracy to some degree about the end state that we want to achieve for Afghanistan because there is no clear definition of what democracy actually means. I mean, I'm quite happy that we talk about diplomacy, that we talk about development, I just wish we wouldn't be hemmed by alliteration into you constantly using the word democracy. We could use another form of alliteration of good governance. Um, but all of those countries of the region have very strong interests in seeing good governance um, in Afghanistan and, of course, good governance in Pakistan as well because these are the two aspects of the region that are most closely linked to each other, but, but, but they go well beyond that. At the risk of being overly provocative, there perhaps is an argument that in order to, to, to build this country to the point where it can respond, and, and it will always have difficulty in doing this in any event be, just because of where it is geographically, but be, to respond to the aspirations of its people and provide a degree of security and the best quality of life that they can get in that very difficult environment. It cannot be done from a kind of Western Northern Hemisphere base. It can only be done in a sustainable fashion in a way which is culturally sensitive to the fact that this country is in Southern Asia and is called the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So, you know, unless we have that conversation between ourselves in NATO, beyond in ISAF, and in the international community and those who were involved in the bond, unless we have the conversation that this is an Islamic country that we are encouraging to develop into stability, and that that has consequences as far as we are concerned, where is there the debate taking place among the allies that are in Afghanistan about what role Sharia law should play in the future of this country? I mean, it's just absent. It is. Having that discussion when I was a defence minister with my fellow ministers was the nearest thing that I ever experienced through the oral test in the French examination when I was in secondary school. Everybody looked at their feet in the hope that the teacher would not catch their eye. You know, we're not even at the beginning of this discussion. And what I, I mean, I'm, I don't believe that this is hopeless. I don't, I'm not suggesting to people that, with, that, 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 that I am imbued with pessimism about it. I, to my roots, believe that we can do the business in Afghanistan. But we cannot do it unless we are honest. Now, we need to be honest. We, at last, we've got an honesty about the burden sharing as far as military is concerned. At last, there is a realism about that. We should now stop the sterile process of demanding that people do things which we know they are never going to do. We now need an honesty about our ability to be able to do the, the complementary, comprehensive parts of this process. And that will inevitably lead us to the fact that we need to find culturally sensitive partners from the region who share the interest in this development to work with us to do it. So, I mean, I spent a lot of my time watching this development of a regional appreciation with some degree of optimism. I became slightly depressed at first because I heard the definition of the region which stretched it from the Middle East all the way to well into Southern Asia, but it's at last we're getting, I think, now to the region the size that it should be. But it involves a level of engagement with 
the countries that I have identified and a deployment of their resource. And all of them have resource of various amounts in the country. And in Iran's case, they have resource of various types and various aspects of what is going on um, in Afghanistan. So the solution lies, frankly, as the solution lies for Africa and and I have no expertise at all in the Middle East. I'm not even a work in progress in relation to that. But in the Middle East, and the development of regional capacity, and the development of partners who are prepared to do in a culturally sensitive way the things that we cannot do in a sustainable fashion. Thanks very much. Let's go to questions from the floor. Uh, this gentleman here first. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Frank Fletcher. I'm an independent researcher on defense and foreign policy. Uh, and I have a background in Army artillery a while back. Um, my question, Mr. Brown, is with respect to the special intelligence relationship that has existed for decades between the United States and the United Kingdom. Some people feel that the here in the U.S. that the <clears throat> integration of, of Britain into the EU might undermine the uniqueness or perhaps the quality of this relationship. What is your view of this and that of your colleagues? What should the relationship be? Is it changing? It, wh what can you say about this? Um, I mean, there are, there are many aspects of security where we have deep and very trusting relationships with um, our American cousins, partners, colleagues, whatever you might want to call it. I mean, I mean let's move away from this terminology of its speciality of relationships. I mean, the fact of the matter is that our people at all, in all aspects of security have worked together and fought together for so long that they've grown to know and trust each other very well. I mean, there are, there's at least one man in this room in a British uniform whom I passed as I came in, but you know, there are, there are deep and long lasting personal relationships of trust in every aspect of our collective security between the United States the, um, and the UK. And frankly, in my experience, and you observe this when you see these people working together, it relies more upon those relationships and the trust that people have for each other because they work with each other rather than you know, a perception of history or the dynamic of any geopolitical movement. It's about people. Um, now, is it changing? Yes, of course it's changing. I mean, of course it's changing because, you know, the world is a dynamic place. And actually, when you, you, you talk to these people who do this, then they are more 21st, the most 21st century people you would ever know. They have a comprehensive knowledge of the nature of the world that we live in, which would put, you know, many students of politics to shame. They know and understand that this is a changing environment. They are the people who coined the phrase, you cannot do this by military means alone, for example. You know, I mean, we all learn these things from them. So, of course, these relationships do change. Do they change for the worst because of what you describe as the integration of the United Kingdom into Europe? <laughs> An interesting phrase. Um, you know, I mean, some of, us, some of us have difficulty in the United Kingdom getting the denizens of the United Kingdom to recognize that we are part of Europe in the first place. I mean, that's where we are geographically. Um, and, and we were pretty significantly integrated into Europe and have been for a long period of time. Um, at the security level, I mean, I do not think that anybody who seeks to limit the sharing of security information or intelligence information beyond the United Kingdom ought to be concerned that our integration in any aspect of our life or further integration or improvement of relationships with the rest of Europe will in any way um, undermine the confidence that they might have that we will respect that restriction. I have no reason to believe that. I mean, those who follow these things closely will see that we were berated, my God, by you know our courts as a government for our failure to breach just such a conditionality in relation to intelligence information in the celebrated case now of Binyan Mohammed. And uh, you know our government, our minister, sustained that and sustain that position because we had given our word and that was the understanding. I mean, I think the other way that we need to look at this, of course, is that shortly we are about to have, for example, uh, the rejoining of France to the military committee of, of NATO. 
this is a nuclear power. Right. I mean, clearly we want to try and avoid the situation which happened in the North Sea only a matter of days ago where two of our submarines collided with each other because of the outstanding success of the equipment that we provide them with to prevent other people from knowing that they exist. But, you know, this, um, this improving relationship of confidence in a security sense between a Sarkozy-led France and the United States of America is going to be even more of a challenge to this closed environment that you refer to. Now, is that a good thing? Well, I mean, in my view, unequivocally, yes, it is a good thing. Now, if um, every other country in the world had the same relationship with the United States of America, the same relationship of confidence, the same relationship of sharing, and the same relationship of common commitment as the United Kingdom has historically had and continues to have with the United States, that would be a better environment for us to live in than the one that we presently live in. So you should go back to these unnamed sources that you have and say to them that they should be encouraging the sharing by the United States with confidence and, and in confidence building with other people of the information that they have that can lead to our collective security rather than concerning themselves about whether or not Britain's going to let them down and keeping their word because we do. Sorry? Yeah, well, you're talking to a Scot, of course. I mean, we reach over England historically in an old alliance to the French and have done for many years. I don't have the suspicions of the French that many other people have, and I don't use the disparaging phrases that people do about them. Daniel, uh, Daniel Whitman, I'm a student at GW in DC. Um, there was a recent article in the uh, Economist magazine a few weeks ago, um, a long three-page article about expressing concern about the current state of the British uh, military. And I was just wondering, um, what do you, how do you assess the uh, current state of the uh, military? Does it, what changes or what, what should be uh, made to improve it? And do you have any concerns about it? Um, I didn't read that particular article, but maybe I should go now and read it. I mean, I, one of the frustrating things about The Economist is that there's invariably not a byline in The Economist here. I was trying to who wrote the damn thing. But um, <laughs> the, um, the British military is, is because, we, you know, because we have been involved in two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, since 2001 and 2003, respectively, as in the words of um, the Chief of the Defence Staff running hot. You know, we are operating beyond the, uh, the level at which we planned to operate effectively. I mean, there are all sorts of technical phraseology that people who operate in this arena use for that, but essentially that's uh, what we have been doing. Um, there is a concern which I and other ministers shared and articulated that if we continue to do that, for an extended period of time, then we would damage the core of our military forces. There was no question that that was the case. We never at any time, when I was the Secretary of State for Defence, planned to do that. The challenge was whether or not we would be able to fulfil those plans. Essentially, the challenge was that we would be able to improve the situation in Iraq to the extent that we could draw down our forces from southern Iraq in order to give us the flexibility in terms of our forces to be able to train. I mean, one of the, one of the early lessons that I received as the Secretary of State for Defence appointed from a non-military environment altogether into that job was that, contrary to my expectation, when one trains the military to m work in operations and deploys them into operations, you degrade their training in operations and don't improve it. I mean, I was of the naive view that if you train somebody to do something and they continue to do it, they'd be d better at doing it. But that's not the way it works, because military operations, particularly intensity of battle, are entirely different from any other environment you would ever be in. And you degrade people's ability to be able to do it and, 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 and the phraseology that people use is that you burn out the core of the force. Um, so we had plans, you know, not to get ourselves into that situation. Um, and we haven't. And we will in the spring of this year approximately. We will draw our troops back substantially from Iraq and that will give us the flexibility that we need in order to be able to go back to training and rebuilding the core of our forces. Now, there's always an argument about the level of investment, but we sustained and in real terms increased the amount of money that we invested. I mean, 
um, in our armed forces. And we have, over and above that, devoted a significant amount of investment into equipping them to uh, operate in the environment that they're presently in. And I can say, I think, without fear of contradiction, that presently our troops in Afghanistan are as well equipped as any troops in the world and as best as they can be equipped in terms of the... Uh, well, with one exception, perhaps, and that's um, helicopters, but we have we have plans in place which will come to fruition shortly to improve significantly the amount of helicopter support that we can give. So, you know, we asked our troops to do more than we had planned for them to do. It had an effect on them for a period of time. Um, I think we are now in a position where we can redress that balance and we can continue to invest. But the demands of these uh, difficult and complex environments challenge even the resources of the United States of America. You know, this is your executive government as a government that goes to Congress and comes back with more money than asks for for defense. I don't live in that, and I didn't live in that environment when I was the Secretary of State for Defence. But even those who did live in that environment found that what they were asking their troops to do was challenging and was having a detrimental effect on the total ability of their forces. We only have time for a couple more questions, so I'm going to try to bunch a couple of them together. Please, if I may yeah. you. Uh, this lady here first. Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Limbaugh with the British American Security Information Council. Thank you for your um, efforts here today. Uh, you touched upon <laughs> um, the importance and the responsibility of the permanent five members of the UN Security Council with regards to nuclear disarmament. And last year before the conference on disarmament, uh, you had made a landmark presentation on, on uh, measures laying the groundwork. Uh, for verification measures and multilateral nuclear disarmament in light of the recent presentation by the Foreign Secretary on Nuclear Weapons, the six-point plan that he delivered. Um, in addition to verification measures, what other um, measures do you see that, you know, there would be for a center um, for uh, transatlantic cooperation on nuclear disarmament? What do you see would be the most important measures, you know, verification and other measures that could be taken um, to lower the current levels of nuclear arsenals? One more before yeah. you do that. Uh, sir, you're on the side. Right. Uh, Dean Pittman, State Department. Uh, go back to Ruben's question, if I could. Uh, Ruben asked you know, if uh, our allies can't uh, meet some of the requests for additional commitments in Afghanistan, where does that leave Afghanistan? I just make, make the question a little more broad, and where does that leave NATO? Um, well, I mean, I'll deal with these questions in reverse. I mean, the, 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 the first of them, requires me to find places in my notes <laughs> of a list of things that, that, that I think are priorities in terms of, uh, in terms, in terms of the um, NPT and, and, and the, the, the whole issue of disarmament, and I would like to be quite specific about that. But the, um, I mean, NATO, in my view, is capable of transforming itself into a continually successful political and military alliance serve the demands of the 21st century. I'm in no doubt about that. The um, irony in that sense of Afghanistan is that while NATO at its ministerial and leadership level has been very shy of the issue of transformation or change, transformation has been driven more quickly in individual countries by Afghanistan than by any other factor. Even in the short time that I was the Secretary of State for Defence, we saw the transformation of the capability of a significant number of the members of NATO. Some of this is of no great significance in the greater scheme of things when people do these numerical counts of the numbers of troops that are there and who's whatever. Because some of these countries are very small. But they have transformed their, their forces. I mean, many of the former Warsaw Pact countries have transformed large standing armies, quite often of conscripts, into professional armies equipped with niche capabilities to be able to do the sort of work that counterinsurgency needs. They can't do it at the scale. I mean, you can't expect Latvia, for example, to be able to do it at the scale that the United States can. I mean, that's a ridiculous point to make. But it is descriptive. But they can do it. And in the majority, the countries of NATO have forces that are deployable. 
in a counterinsurgency environment and have the political will to do it. Now, there are a number of outstanding larger examples of this. I mean, your nearest geographical neighbour here, Canada, has transformed its troops in the context of Afghanistan from peace fighting to war fighting troops in less than five years. Denmark is another example. The Netherlands is a further example. There are any amount of these examples. So, you know, NATO can be forged on the anvil rather than broken in the anvil of Afghanistan if it allows itself to do it. But we can accelerate that, accelerate that process if the political leadership for transformation is given where it should be and the attention is given, you know, in NATO. And the next Secretary General of NATO will have to lead this process. So whoever gets that job is, is a very important appointment. And more attention should be being paid to it than is apparently being paid to it at the moment. Who gets that job and where they come from and what their motivation is in terms of the leadership of that organisation will determine whether or not the political leadership is prepared to engage in the debate and discussion and investment that is necessary over the next 10 days, but NATO will survive. Can I just, um, I'm sorry I haven't found these notes, but I just, just, just let me respond in a kind of generic sense to your very specific question and I'll talk to you later about this. Um, we uh, embarked upon a process of renewing um, our commitment to the nuclear deterrent by having the promised public debate about the new boats that were necessary to provide a platform for it. I was responsible for the publication of the white paper and I led the debate in the United Kingdom over this issue and, and, and with some pride say that I was more open um, about the deterrent, about the, uh, the, the, the kind of political underpinning for the nature of it, you know, about, about the facts of it, um, than any minister has ever been in the history of the world. We, I hope, have, uh, have set a, a kind of um, template for openness that others in the world will follow in terms of the debate. We succeeded in that debate and we got significant um, political support for the decision to um, embark upon the building of the very expensive next generation of boats to um, retain our nuclear deterrent. But we gave an undertaking. And that undertaking was that we would engage in the process of disarmament and in the review of the NPT in, in, a, in, a, way, in a leadership way. Immediately after we uh, secured the vote in Parliament, Margaret Beckett, who then was the Foreign Secretary, made a very important speech in the Carnegie Institution. And I followed it up by um, what, to my surprise, was the first ever visit by a Defence Minister to the Standing um, Disarmament Commission. I couldn't believe that no Defence Minister had ever gone and spoken um, to that Commission in Geneva. And, 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 and the speech which um, Margaret's successor, David Miliband, gave recently was a manifestation of our continuing commitment to that leadership. Now, I don't want to give an exhaustive list of the things that we can do, but the verification uh, process, the um, joint venture effectively that we embarked upon with Norway was a very important confidence building measure and was responded to, I thought, very positively by the international community. And I was delighted about that. And that's what it was intended to do. What we now have, of course, is we have an injection of energy into that area that we could never have provided, but that could only have been provided by the President of the United States of America and now is being provided by him. I just say this, though. This is being misunderstood across the world. And there needs to be far more flesh put on the bones in this leadership from the United States. Now, engagement with Russia, reduction in warheads, which is, I think, almost now inevitable and should be an inevitable consequence in any event of the current economic state of the world, if we have any sense, will all be a very good thing. But we, some of us, wait with a degree of bated breath to see what the United States is prepared to countenance in the context of the NPT review. I just say this to you, from the politics, the present politics of the United Kingdom, all parties, there will be no lack of engagement from us, of support for that initiative. There is a growing view in the world, and I welcome this, that those of us who have to a degree kept comparatively silent about this issue for far too long ought now to make it be known that we are multilateral disarmers and always have been. And we should give that message to the world and engage in that process as quickly as possible. Now, there will be a number of specific things. I'll share them with you later on. But I think we can do. Um, I won't bore the other people with them at the moment. I'll talk to you later. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Brown for coming and speaking with us today.